Kamakahiki! Lama Kamakahiki!
Aloha, I'm Helani Sonora Pale. I'm a citizen of Kalahui, Hawaii. And I'm here with um, Leini Heo, Leanui Nui Heo, who is the chair of Kalahui, Hawaii, Komike Kalai Aina. And we're here um, just talking about Lonoi Kamakahiki and the Makahiki ceremony and procession that we had just uh, finished planning and implementing for the community of Mauna Lua and Kulio'o. Why plan a makahiki here on Oahu? Why, um, why was it important to do that? Okay, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> maybe I'll open with um, a small oli. Well, I'll just state that oli. Um, o wahi mai o nuna, o wahi mai o lalo, o wahi mai o buka, No, no. Where is the space above? Where is the space below? Where is the space uplands? Where is the space down in the ocean? Where are you? It is Lono. Lono Ikamakahiki is this time of the year. And that chant speaks to the spaces and places that Lono occupies. And. Um, Right now, in this month of Ikuwa, I think we're in Ikuwa, probably transitioning into the next month, but in a month, we're in Makali. Okay, my kai. So, Loloika Makahiki, the celebration of Lono, is to me, I've learned it from my beginnings when I was an activist in our movement and I participated in several Loloika Makahiki celebrations on Koho Olave and that was eons ago but as of last week um, this is the first time I got to participate and actually help in the planning of the celebration of Lono Ika Makahiki this year and I wanted to do that um, first of all I heard about um, about two years ago members of Kalahui Hawaii went 
and became a part of this natural spring down here in Kulio'o called Kanewai, and I thought, hmm, how nice. And then I learned about this heiau out here in Hawaii area, or Kuapa, as it used to be known as Havea. So when I heard that name, I said, I only know that name one place in the whole entire archive of my mind is that Havea was the sacred drums that was brought to Hawaii. And I believe it was brought on one of the va'as, and it could have been uh, Lono, who came from Tahiti, therefore Lono Ika Makahiki or Lono Maika Hiki Mai, who brought these drums. Uh, so in the course of learning these two, two things in recent history, you know, I thought, oh, these places are really special. I never knew there was a place outside of the sacred drum named Havea, and I never knew of today where there was any freshwater spring. And it kind of came to mind that Lonoika Makahiki, or the season of uh, Makahiki is coming, which is really uh, the whole, our Tupuna's way of acknowledging or recognizing the change in season. And so they marked it with the rising of Makali'i, the Pleiades, which is ri rising now. And they attributed it to a of abundance and prosperity and intelligence and um, aloha and the, all the good fortunes that would come to our kupuna. So they marked that time. And I'm a Hawaiian studies major, and I learned a lot of historical texts to some of our traditions and celebrations and an opportunity to try to bring these two elements, these two spaces together in tribute of recognizing the change of season with the rise of Lonika Makahiki, who, who reigns over this four month period and everyone is to, it's to bring out the Maoli, our, our, our sacred selves, to expose that. And this was the first time I've actually kind of organized a small scale festivity for that. And along with the help of uh, fellow members of Kalahui Hawaii, our Komike, which is the steering committee of Kalahui, help um, make that happen. So in a very short period, in our very, very busy lives, under the cover of a global pandemic, um, it was time to find an answer. It was time to, for me to find an answer. How can we find a way for our people to find some salvation in this kind of chaotic period? And what better thing to do is to turn ourselves back uh, to traditions, back to ourselves caught up in what is going on the setting, focus on our natural setting. You know? And when we think natural, like the trees, the water, the mountains, the plants, the foods, the things that Kupuna did, it brings a sense of solace. And I think that's one of the things that Lono did in traditional times. It brought everybody closer to themselves after maybe eight months of intensive labor that they had to, they, they were required to take a, I don't know what they would call it in other spiritual terms, but, a, and it's said in Hawaiian language, you know, hula, and it's interpreted in many dances as a respite. Is that what it's called, a respite? Yeah. A real, real big pause and just do everything, not completely opposite, but everything that eases their, not, their daily lives and brings out the best of the people. What was the impact that you saw of this event? What was, your, what was the impact that you wanted and what was it that was realized? What was the impact that was realized in this event? So one thing about, I know, when it comes to ceremonies, or rituals, or practices that are supposed to enhance the individual or the collective that they're with or try to bring direction is um, it takes a lot of work and but in the case not but with regards to Lono Ikamakahiki season what I've learned was it's all about the gathering of resources today that can help 
impact or ho'omana, you know, re-energize these traditions. And to do that, you need the appropriate implements. You need the, well, at least in this, as best you can. Your intentions are, by Kanaka Maoli, like myself, is to, to make every effort to uh, get the natural resources. And when you can't get the natural resources to do that, you have to be able to, in your mind and in your spirit, reckon how this proxy will fit in today's terms. And someone who's trying to maintain traditions as best as I can, and as many ceremonies as you'll see, they do the same thing. They work their hardest to get the natural resources to raise the mana and the gathering for the purpose of making contribute at its highest form. And when you lack those accesses, which is one of the biggest problems in today's world, is when you lack accesses to those resources, you have to improvise and adapt. And as a model for Kuna, we have to adapt to make these things. Preceding um, years to contact who are best, they did their best, that to represent that at their highest forms. There's many things that they have done. There's evidence today that testifies to the fact of the brilliance of our kupuna when they were working with their natural resources. So me and other Kanaka Mali today want to mimic in the best way we can to attribute, um, uh, I want to say, come forth with such unselfishness to surrender to the highest form spiritually and if we can attain those resources, it is great. But it doesn't prevent us from actually not getting the fullest potential of our exercise in trying to hold on things. So having places that are still in existence or being made aware, being made aware of less than a month ago that this heiau out here in Hawaii Kai was called Havea. And it echoed in the back of the archives of my mind the sacredness. Havea didn't get here to Hawaii to like, I don't know, I don't think I've been stabbing this like the ninth century. That's a very long time ago. I could be wrong with that timetable, but regardless of that, it, be, it was retained here, the memory of the signature that has raised the spiritual uh, aspirations and uh, spirituality of our Kukuna is in view in these artifacts that are still here today. And in this case, the name only, not the drum, carries the weight of that manao, or what is that, ko'i ko'i, the weight and responsibility of understanding that. So, I got excited <laughs> for Lonoika Makahiki. I've participated in many activities off island, on island, um, but this one was very key. Havea came into the picture, and then the association of the Punawai or Kanevai that's in here in Kulio. I felt for myself um, a way to share with this community um, in organizing this gathering. Uh, if there were more people that were of like minds with regards to Hawaiian traditions and um, having a small gathering to start this off was interesting because many of the families that participated, our numbers were small, but many of them came from East Honolulu. I am a Malahini to this area, who was just aiding in the understanding of um, traditional Malahini to change the season. So I felt, I think the result was positive in that it told me that there are people out there just helping to be an instrument to bring it together. So my personal um, uh, goal in this was to have everyone else feel the same, that we're all in a collective way, that we achieve a higher form of spiritual attainment through the practice of our tradition. And I think with this small group, it was evident 
um, from the families that were here. I had learned later, many of them have strong genealogies to this area. So as a Malihini, I learned this all within a very short window of time. So like I said, it does take a lot of planning to do this. And that one was to know the individuals which I didn't have enough time for that. But nevertheless, shortly after our closing of our procession, I got to talk to those families and learn that, wow, these ties are strong. So I got more out of it that um, these individuals that came, even though I knew there were families from here, that there were really families that were deeply tied and rooted to this side of the island. Like we had a descendant from the Pa'au family. And just, what is another one of those um, old families that were out here? I can't remember all their names because I'm a Malahini, so. Oh, the Marquez Ohana? Yeah, they're, I mean, I had some deep conversations about their lines of um, connection to these areas. Wires. Uh, my, yeah, so a name like that, you know, non uh, Ahaolin last name, you wouldn't make that association right away other than the fact that they have Kanaka Maoli blood in them, but then it went more than that. And so, not that it was an unex, uh, unexpected, it's just that at that moment I realized I had learned, I had gone from just being the alaka'i, leading people down a processional march, staying in observance, doing their best to keep their kupuna with them on the walk and make them safe and try to do the chants and help elevate us. Then at the closing, I had learned that there was more deeply rooted ohana that lived out in this side. So for me, that was a, that was umeke ka'eo, or the, in this case, umeke ogi olono was a very fulfilling of that um, goal. As for everyone else, it seemed as though they were deeply gratified to express themselves. Um, whether it, it didn't matter if they vocalized it, but they, they took simple commands. We're going to walk down this way, we'll single file, we'll regroup and form up again because of COVID, narrow sidewalks, lots of traffic. It took some planning. It's not like walking when we did Koho Olave. Yeah, everyone kind of, you know, there's no other distractions. Here, we're bombarded by distractions. So to maintain a sense of uniformity in spirituality was to maintain uniformity. And a lot of the families, like, they seem to have come ready in that way. They were very makakao in their own selves. And to find that out uh, throughout the course of the walk and then have that conversation with those ohana, was really, really, really inspiring. It was very, deeply gratifying for me. And I believe it was deeply gratifying for them. The Lama Ku um, that was engineered by another member of our hui um, was significant in that it was supposed to, in her mind, was to express the, the heightened intelligence and conscientiousness or spirituality of our kupuna, and it was very important for her to have the lamaku. And with that in mind, uh, there is kapus to the lamaku, but in this case, in the 21st century, that awakening and bringing back some traditions, notwithstanding or disregarding those traditions, is that it made sense to have that because we needed some enlightenment, and that was a symbol of um, lono. We're just adding one more potency to our prayer, and then having it lit as the sun goes down, you know, it going down didn't mean that it was the end of our ceremony. It was lighting our way through the darkness to the deeper understanding. And that made complete sense. So the importance of the Makahiki for Kanaka Maoli here in Hawaii during this time and to recognize the Makahiki was not just the, for the cultural and spiritual benefit of our Lahui, but it was for, it was a political statement as well. My professor, Dr. Hanani K. Trask, always said that culture is the core of our resistance. And that is so true on so many levels. 
this was a cultural event, quote unquote, but it was also a very political event. Our people did not compartmentalize their world like we do now in ancient times. Everything was all intertwined. So it was the cultural, the religious, the spiritual, the, um, the economy, everything was intertwined. And so with the Makahiki, it wasn't just a cultural event, it was also a political event. It was a time when the Ali'i went around the islands and rec reclaimed what was theirs and uh, with Lono Ika Makahiki gathering the abundance of the Aina. It was very political because it was, it was where our people would, would actually give the bounty of the land to the Ali'i. So it was, it was a very political act. And in reenacting in, in a very symbolic way, our Makahiki here on the most urbanized island of all the islands. This is where, on Oahu, is where we have a million people living, most of them settlers. We're a minority in our own homeland as Kanaka Maoli. So to hold a Makahiki at the appropriate time as, for, as a recognition of the changing of the seasons from summer to the rainy season, from Kauvela to Hoilo, that was an important piece in our rising as a Lahui because we need to start doing that more. The fact that a makahiki wasn't done on this side of the island for, I would guess about 200 years, that speaks to the importance of what we uh, were able to accomplish that day on November 14th. Uh, if, you, if you're not sure about our history, if, if you don't know about our history, when our Hawaiian kingdom was illegally overthrown, one of the, the first things they did was seize our lands. We are the heirs to two million acres of what is probably the most expensive land in the world, <laughs> real estate in the world. And we are, since the overthrow, have been living in a state of oppression and um, in, dest in a destitute state. Our people make up 40% of the houseless. Some, in some areas, we make up 50% of the houseless. So what has happened to our people as a, as a consequence of colonization is our people have been basically robbed of our birthright. <laughs> we have been um, made to forget our traditions, who we are, made to even feel ashamed of them. And, and that's, that's, all, that, that's how colonization works. I mean, it's all about dehumanizing us as, as Kanaka, as human beings. And it wasn't until like the 1970s that all of this started coming back, who we were, our rights to these Ainas, um, you know, basically our traditions with the renaissance of our Olelo Hawaii, Again, it was culture, culture, the olelo, that brought us back to being kind of, it just kind of ho'a, it, it turned that light on politically to make us want to or see things in a different light, right? So part of reclaiming who we are as Kanaka, culturally, spiritually, is very political. And it's always been part of our political resistance to the colonization of Hawaii. Uh, I've been in the movement for over 20 years, and in our resistance, we always have, it's always about our culture and who we are. It's about reclaiming who we are as Kanaka. You cannot separate the cultural and the political movements of Kanaka. They're so intertwined because even if you're not, if you're not political and you're cultural, you are political, you know? And if you're political, you are being cultural because our people were very political people. <laughs> I mean, it's all about, it, 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 we, we don't compartmentalize things, you know. It's not like, okay, you're a political person, you're a cultural person. Hawaiians, we got to relook at ourselves in a more holistic way and look at everything we do as being political, as being cultural.
it's about reclamation of all of that in the spiritual as well, the unseen. So I just wanted to share that because for me, as someone who deals a lot in the political realms, who advocates a lot, um, writes testimony a lot, um, organizes workshops a lot, I do a lot of political work in the community, but for me, this cultural event was a very political event, probably one of the most political events, because we were walking through a very urbanized area, you know, and that's part of what colonization does, is that they try to erase all, all traces of you and your people. And so reconnecting two sacred spaces in Mauna Lua, which they now call Hawaii Kai, and in Kulio'o, reconnecting those sacred spaces by walking and opening up the vehe of the time of Lono was very political because it was here we are and we haven't gone anywhere. We're still here and we're rising. So it's about building that consciousness, you know, building it up even more, lighting up that fire in our people, but also educating those outside. So if you were, a, if you're a settler here and you had no idea if about Kanaka on that day when you saw us walking in East Oahu, one of the most affluent neighborhoods in, Ho in Hawaii as Kanaka with our regalia with as a lahui in ceremony if you saw us that day then you knew that we were still here that we haven't gone anywhere and we're not going anywhere we're going to continue reclaiming what is ours and we're we're not going to um, disappear and I, I just want to quote Uncle Skippy, who said, we're the evidence, not the crime. Because that's the truth of it. I mean, if the, the state flourishes on the oppression of Kanaka Maoli, the U.S. military bases sits on stolen Hawaiian lands. That's the truth of our existence, is that these are our lands where the heirs, um, and in every way they can, the U.S. and the state of Hawaii bombards us with um, with death and with degradation and oppression. We need to, part of waking up is, you know, looking at all the different fronts because it, it's exhausting being a Kanaka um, in the movement because there's so much work, endless because it never ends. The U.S. continues to, um, to bomb our sacred places, refuses to clean up their messes. The state of Hawaii will probably be try to use our lands to come out of this economic crisis that they're in. All these lands that are stolen. We need to just maka'ala and we need to continue what we're doing and never forget where we came from. The part of the makahiki was remembering that, connecting to our kupuna and our ancestors and bringing them back. You know, it was, it was a reciprocal ceremony where we gave our mana to these sacred places and to our kupuna and we in, the, in turn got mana back from them. So it, it, was about, it, was, it was about so many different things on so many different levels. But for me, as a political, as someone who's in the political realm, it was a very political event. It was something that needed to be done. And I think it needs to be done in every single neighborhood, on all islands. Unfortunately, we are living in a pandemic, so it was difficult to do it while keeping our pe people safe. But eventually, we all need to, to bring these traditions back. And, you know, I, I know... An, and it's, it's hard, it's hard for some Kanaka to do things like this, to go back to our traditions because we were taught to feel ashamed of who we were, to make us feel like, like what we were doing was devilry or some kind of, you know, heva, you know, when really Hawaiians, Kanaka had such a, a connection to the Aina, you know, this was a, this was about recognizing that and recognizing that our people understood the seasons here in Hawaii, like 
no one else did, you know. So I think we need to kind of just brush away all of that stigma about what it means to be Hawaiian. Stop being ashamed of it. Be Hawaiian, be Kanaka. And that's what the Makahiki was about for me. And if you're a settler here and you saw us, hopefully that'll help you to rate raise your consciousness about who we are as a Kanak, as a people, as a Lahui, and make you want to learn more about our people. So it was a very peaceful event. It was beautiful. And mahalo to everyone who did participate and to the community members. You know, I do live on this side of the island on, in Kulio'o, and it was important for me as a Kanaka who have, I have raised my children here to do cultural events here to be part and to reconnect my my keiki to the aina so it was about our kupuna and our keiki really mahalo aloha everyone Kamakahiki! Oh, no,